Welcome to the John Gets Games update vlog for April 2022, where I'll be talking about a few different things today. Now, before we go into that, I would like to mention that you can listen to an audio version of this vlog in podcast form by supporting the John Gets Games Patreon campaign. You can learn more about that by going to patreon.com slash John Gets Games, and you can gain access to a bunch of other perks like exclusive content. Now, that's the first section I'd like to talk about in these update vlogs. I made a bunch of exclusive content for the Patreon supporters last month. Uh, in particular, I put out four opinions episodes, uh, and I talked about 17 different games, many of them multiple times. Uh, again, every time I play a game, I just talk about it, whether or not it's my first or, like, 11th play in the case of Ark Nova. I keep uh, discussing that one over and over again, and you can gain access to those by supporting the Patreon campaign. Uh, in addition to that, there is a piece of exclusive content coming out soon. It didn't come out last month, where I'm planning on putting out a uh, Maracaibo Uprising cooperative mode full playthrough as an exclusive for the Patreon supporters, uh, mostly because it was originally filmed to be a full-fledged uh, video for the channel, but there were some technical difficulties. It, it still works, and I still would love for people to watch it if they want to, but um, <laughs> the pink screen that we tried didn't work very well, and I'll talk about that soon. Uh, when it comes to other content, uh, the Friendly Ties podcast put out one episode over the last month, and we've recorded a couple others. Uh, that one episode was engine building, or specifically Nick Ruins engine building, which was the uh, clickbaity term we did decided to go with. And that's been one of our most successful episodes so far. Uh, tons of comments, uh, lots of really interesting opinions about uh, what people think about engine building in general. It was a lot of fun to make it. It was really cool to see um, it be so well received. So we are certainly hoping to do that kind of content a little bit more with Friendly Ties. I will say that we've also recorded two more episodes. Uh, those are going to be coming out probably in the next few weeks. Uh, one of them all about the board game Cape May, and the other one all about Maracaibo Uprising with the competitive and cooperative modes. So you can keep your uh, ears out for that one. Uh, that should be hopefully coming again in a couple weeks. Now, on that note, let's move into some general updates. And honestly, I just have one to realistically talk about, and it's the uh, playthroughs. <laughs> I talked about those last month, and I think I even ended that video saying, I wonder how many of those I'll get out before the next update vlog. And the answer ended up being zero. <laughs> uh, as I briefly mentioned before, we did record a full playthrough for Maracaibo Uprising, and we kind of intended that to be the first one, but there were um, video and audio issues. It's interesting trying to make new content. <laughs> we made a couple of experiments already, and this third experiment definitely had some problems. Um, we felt like we wanted to iterate on the green screen idea that we had before because there were some green screen hole uh, problems where, like, the green in cards was getting pulled out. So I got this hot pink uh, construction paper, and we filmed the Maracaibo uh, uh, playthrough with that, and it just did not work. Like, it really didn't work way worse than the green screen. So I probably should have tested that before we recorded, like, a two-hour game. But either way, uh, that was a problem. And then we did some audio uh, tests with different microphones, and it just did not sound very good. So subsequent to making that Maracaibo uh, playthrough, uh, I bought a couple microphones to experiment around, and in fact, I'm going to be returning all of that very soon. Uh, crazily enough, it feels like the best solution for us right now is my iPhone. Like, we tried all sorts of things, and then accidentally we had an iPhone recording just us around the table, and then we checked that against various other microphones, including lapels that we had on each other's shirts and everything, and the iPhone just sounded good. It's crazy. <laughs> I, I'm honestly flabbergasted that the best solution that we have right now is this, but it, it really doesn't sound bad. So it's passable for the moment. It's what we're going to do uh, in the short run. Uh, we've actually filmed two more uh, playthroughs, and those realistically should be uh, the first ones that go public on the John Gets Games uh, YouTube channel. Uh, those are Hellas, the version that came out in, I think, 2017, as well as Equinox, the version that came out in, like, 2012, because there's some duplicates for both of those games. Um, they're, uh, they're each interesting games. Uh, Anastasia and I both really like Hellas, so we filmed that one, and I really like Equinox, and I wanted to introduce it to her, so we played that one as well. Uh, those are recorded. I'll be editing those relatively soon. I'll put those up uh, early to the Patreon supporters of the channel, but again, uh, unless something something goes catastrophically wrong, those should actually go uh, to the public, and I really can't wait to see what people think about those videos. Um, I mentioned last month that we're likely going to be highlighting less popular games, not necessarily by design, but those are just kind of the ones we really want to 
talk about right now. Uh, we're also hoping to kind of wrap them into uh, bundles and maybe even talk about them on Friendly Ties. Uh, uh, Hellas is the third game that we played uh, by the designer Stefan Dora. The others were Valletta and Milestones, both of which had technical problems and both of which uh, are exclusive playthroughs you could watch if you're a supporter of the uh, Patreon campaign. But that's three Stefan Dora uh, uh, games. So we're thinking we might do a uh, Friendly Ties episode where we discuss Stefan Dora games in general. And we might do more of that stuff in the future. There's a lot of ideas, Malinga around, and I like to communicate those to a certain extent. So uh, hopefully we'll see some of those things happen. Uh, hopefully, honestly, all three of those playthroughs go out. The Maracaibo Uprising as a Patreon exclusive, and then uh, also Equinox and Hellas uh, going out to everybody. I, I really can't wait to hear what people think. I really enjoyed making them. Uh, the overall goal that we had for them was to just turn the cameras on and then just teach the game almost as if, you know, there were other people around the table, just like normal, and then we just played the game and really didn't try to ham things up for the camera or or really do much of that. We just tried to play the game and be there and have a good time, and both of them turned out really well. I won't spoil the endings for any of these, uh, but uh, they were very fun games. We actually filmed both of those back-to-back -back in one day, so that was a blast. Uh, so yeah, um, keep your eyes up for those. Hopefully they will be appearing on the channel at some point relatively soon, uh, and then I'm sure I'll talk about it more next month. <laughs> in that update vlog. Either way, that is uh, realistically the only update that I have right now, so let's move on to the shifting shelf. Um, I pulled seven games out of our collection this month and then somehow added 11 new games. I am just on its hair with getting new games. Um, some of them are press copies. A lot of them I've been buying. <laughs> We've got a lot of games in this house right now, but either way, let's talk about the games that are leaving first. Uh, I'm going through all of these in alphabetical order, and the first one is Crusaders. I've had this game since the uh, first edition. Was it a Kickstarter? I think it was. I don't even remember for sure, but anyway, I, I got the original version. I played it a whole bunch, and most recently, I played it as part of Friendly Ties. That was our... Uh, like our third episode, I think, that we put out. And we also had a playing with friends uh, tabletop simulator mode type of playthrough for it. And I enjoyed that play. I talked quite a bit about my opinions of the game in that Friendly Ties episode as well. Um, but I found myself in the situation where I think I might be kind of done with it. Like, like, I've really enjoyed playing Crusaders in the past. For a long time, I kind of told myself that if I gained access to the new expansion that was apparently produced like two or three years ago and it's been sitting in a warehouse in China somewhere for that whole time, uh, I told myself if I gained access to that, then I would definitely want to get that to experience that expansion with the overall game. But now that I actually have access to that because those games have come over, I believe Renegade helped make that happen. Um, so I saw pre-orders go up for it and I didn't buy it. And that was kind of a, an interesting moment for me because I assumed I would. And I really thought about it and I was like, you know, even with that expansion, um, which does seem interesting, I think I might just be kind of over Crusaders. Again, I had quite a bit of fun with it, but I played it many, many times. So I think it probably makes sense to move that one on and save that uh, shelf space for something else because I obviously have a problem with so many new games coming in. Uh, after that, we have a very tiny game. It's called Gear. I, I'm sure that's not how you're supposed to pronounce it. I believe uh, when translated into English, it means greed. Uh, it is. Uh, it was designed by Alexander Pfister. It's this tiny little card game that I picked up at Essen in 2018, I think. Uh, I think it was like the first game I bought. It just went right over to the Amiga booth, I believe. And uh, I bought it for like eight euros or something like that. Um, now, I played it like three or four times soon after I got it. And I thought it was fine. It's, it's all about stealing things back and forth from each other. And honestly, I don't remember a lot of the details. I just remember it's relatively take that. It took like 10 to 15 minutes. We laughed a decent amount when we played it, but I found myself never coming back to it. So I'm not really saving that much shelf space by removing it from the collection, but I think I need to also keep my eye on all the tiny games because those also add up. And the more of those I have, the harder it is to, to find the ones that I really want to play. They kind of get lost amongst a whole bunch. And I could easily see myself not coming back to this one. Uh, after that, we have Gugong, which is a game I have also had since the uh, first edition. I have the deluxe version of it, actually. Um, I really liked this game, but I didn't love it. I never quite fell in love with it. The designer is Andreas Stedding, uh, and I've liked quite a few of his designs in the past, and I think that's part of the reason I really wanted to love Gugong. Um, it's a fascinating Euro game of uh, card trading, essentially of gifting, like gifting out cards and then taking them back and then doing various things. But my big problem with the game is that, uh, well, the, the big problem with keeping it in the collection anyway, is that it's been so long uh, since I played it that I need to completely relearn it. And I do also remember that it's the kind of game that has like five mini systems that you have to teach. And it's just quite a bit to teach. And when I looked at our selection of Euro games in our shelf, I realized I would 
probably rather play like 15 other Euro games before I came to this one, even though if somebody sat down and said, I want to play Gugong right now, I'd probably be like, sure, <laughs> I haven't played that in a while. Like, I'd definitely be curious to, to jump into it again. I just don't see myself being the person to push for that. So I don't really think it should stick around on the shelf. Like if, if I don't see myself ever really uh, making it get played again, then we should probably move it on. And also, I'm pretty sure there's at least one or two other copies in the general friend group of people that I play games with. So I certainly could have more opportunities to play it if I want to in the future. I played it a few times. It's a fascinating game. It just, it's not rising up to the level of so many others that I would probably rather reach for. After that, we have Nicaea. Uh, this is one of the newest games designed by Amabel Holland and uh, published by Hollandspiel. I'm a really big fan of Amabel's designs. Uh, I actually, uh, there's this website called uh, geekgroup.app, I think, and it can really parse all your data on Board Game Geek a whole bunch. And when I parsed it down for like, who, which designers do I own the most games from? It was uh, Reiner Knizia and then Amabel Holland. <laughs> like, I've got a lot of her designs. Uh, and I was really excited about Nicaea. Uh, it's a, uh, it's set in like 2,000 years ago. It's all about uh, essentially uh, Christian politicking about uh, scripture and about what's going to be canon and what isn't. And it's um, hypothetically kind of a, a uh, shared incentive type game. It's got quite a bit going on. And ultimately that's essentially where it fell down for me. I played it once and it was fine, but it was strangely hard to teach and it really didn't enamor me the way I was hoping it would. Uh, I never got it played a second time, but I, I have a hard time seeing myself do that considering at this point I need to do a full relearn of it again. And again, my, my first impression wasn't super glowing. So I think uh, it's a really fascinating game and I think it's going to work a lot better for some other groups. So I'm going to move that one on and I still own so many of Amabel's games. Uh, it was, I almost felt like just keeping it because I own so many, but I really try not to be a collector. I really try to have our collection in this house be games that we actively want to play and then we don't just keep because they're valuable or they make sense with a set or that kind of thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Like a lot of people do that and that's totally fine. We just don't have the space for us to be collectors. <laughs> uh, moving on, we have Origins First Builders. This was a board and dice release that came out a few months ago. Uh, it's a neat little Euro uh, game with dice that you use for actions. There is some tile laying that you do over to the side. Uh, it, the game looked quite neat, but again, it, it suffered from the uh, I've got so many other Euros I'm going to reach for syndrome that I felt like it it made sense to move that one on. Um, after that, we have uh, actually another Amabel Holland design, uh, Supply Lines of the American Revolution, The Southern Strategy. Um, I picked up this one because I heard it was a good war game for people who like Euro games, um, that it's like a war game, but it's all about the supply lines of supplying all the troops uh, more so than actually moving troops around and rolling dice to see them shoot and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I was curious to try it. I threw it onto one of my um, Holland Spiel orders. I played it a couple times and it is an interesting game, but it, it definitely was not for me. Again, a lot of rules uh, definitely to get through. And I remember when I played it the second time, I played both games within a week. So it was like really there in my head. When I played it the second time, I found myself feeling like I would not mind playing this again in the future. But I knew even then that it was likely to be so long until I potentially played it again, that I would need to fully relearn it again. And I just did not have the excitement and zeal uh, for it. Uh, I will say that once I learned a little bit more about this version, because this is actually the second version of Supply Lines of the American Revolution, there's also a Northern version. Um, I think I might actually like the Northern version more. I I'm not sure if I'm going to go out and buy it, but if I had a chance to try that one, I think I probably would. So as you can see, I actually removed two Amabel Holland designs, but I still own so many more. Uh, and I really do, in general, really like her designs. Uh, but, you know, not every design is going to fit. And again, there was a bit of a war game experiment, and I'm not really sure I'm going to ever enjoy war games, but I keep wanting to try every now and then to see if maybe it's something that'll catch me. And uh, so far, the war games that I've tried have not. And that's, I think, more of a personal preference thing than specifically the game. Finally, there is Treasure Island. Uh, I've had this one for a while. Uh, I actually got sent two press copies of this game on accident years ago when it first came out. Uh, I don't remember exactly how that happened, but I got one copy and then like a week later, another one came. I reached out to the publisher about sending it on and they just said it wasn't worth the hassle. Uh, so I actually gave one of those copies to my friend and I kept our copy. Uh, this is a wacky, asymmetric, fully competitive game where one person uh, is essentially locked up in a tower. I f is it Blackbeard? Long John Silver. I think it's Long John Silver. Uh, they've hidden treasure on the island and everybody's wandering around trying to find it by literally drawing with dry erase markers and digging by drawing circles and asking, is the treasure there? Um, as a gimmick, it's super cool. As a game, 
it's a bit long. Uh, it, it never grabbed me the way I really hoped it would. Uh, it felt like the few times I played it, it went 90 minutes to even two hours. It just overstayed its welcome for the gimmick that it was. I loved the idea of wandering around and then digging on the island by putting a little circle stencil down and then drawing around. But ultimately, I just haven't found myself coming back to it. And I know there's another copy in my friend group because I gifted that other press copy on. So I think it makes sense to remove that one and uh, free up some shelf space. So those are the games that are leaving this month, but now we have 11 new games that have arrived. Uh, some of them are small. Uh, the first one is, uh, it's Animalia Preventing Extinction. Uh, I knew nothing about this game. Uh, it showed up as a press copy. It's this tiny little box. Um, I'm going to give it a try at some point, but honestly, I can't even tell you what it's about <laughs> right now. But fortunately, it does not take up that much space. Uh, the next game that arrived is Crescent Moon, uh, which is an Osprey uh, release. It's a highly asymmetric area control game for uh, four to five players. That's the only player count that you can play. You can't even play to three players. Uh, so I've not had a chance to play this one yet. I am very fascinated too. The components are uh, fascinating. The game seems really quite cool overall, but it's likely going to be at least a couple of weeks until I have an opportunity to uh, dig into that and try it and really see what's going on there. I've heard it's, um, it's kind of like Root, but not as asymmetric as Root. Like apparently it has and a quicker teach than Root did, did overall. Uh, the one time I tried Root, I kind of bounced off it, although it didn't really feel like a, a super authentic play. Uh, I wouldn't mind trying it again in the future, but for right now, I'm, I'm quite interested to try out Crescent Moon. It seems like the uh, asymmetry can uh, be relatively varied, not crazily so, but like one character just makes tons of money and other people make money based off of the stuff that they have. Uh, some characters are just better at making a lot of uh, troops and others are really about making infrastructure. I think that's kind of how it works. Uh, there's also this mercenary mechanic where if you're playing a four-player game, you don't play with the nomads and you do mercenaries with a non-player character. But if you play a five-player game, then you do have the nomads. And whenever anybody wants mercenaries, they have to trade with that one nomad player. It sounds fascinating, and I'm hoping to dig into it at some point relatively soon. Uh, the next game to arrive was Cryptid Urban Legends, which is actually another press copy that was sent to me by Osprey Games. This is a much smaller game. It's an asymmetric two-player only game. I think it's a uh, hidden movement, actually, or like one person is sneaking around and the other person is trying to find them. I don't really know the specifics of it, but I am hoping to try this one at some point in the next couple of weeks. After that, I got Founders of Teotihuacan. I was sent a copy of this one so that I can make a sponsored video of it, and I actually just posted that uh, today, the day that I'm filming this update vlog anyway. Uh, so relatively recently uh, when you're hypothetically watching this. Uh, it's a polyomino game with a really interesting conceit where you have an area where you're putting these tiles down and you have production buildings that actually make resources that exist on your polyomino grid. And then you have temples that you put down that are going to score you points. And you want to cram as much stuff as around as you can, but your production buildings, you want to have open space to have area to actually make your resources. So you have a push and pull of some buildings wanting lots of space around them and other buildings you just kind of want to cram together to get big scoring multipliers. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, then please check out the tutorial that I made that's already up. After that, we have Freight Cars. Uh, this one was also sent to me to make a sponsored tutorial. In fact, it's right here on the table. <laughs> it's just off camera. Uh, this is also a polyomino game, actually. It's all about taking polyomino pieces and then fitting them onto your freight cars and then shipping them off and getting a bunch of credits. It's a uh, quite simple game. It's uh, The publisher is Quick Simple Fun, and it definitely matches uh, the publisher's name overall. Uh, I filmed that one, and hypothetically, the video for that will be going out in a week or two. I'll talk about my schedule soon, though. Uh, next up, there is Goat N Goat which is this small little card game that I first heard about a few years ago, a couple years ago, something like that. I can't remember exactly where, but I heard a little bit of hype. It seemed like it was a, a cute, intriguing little card game. So I finally found a copy for uh, a relatively reasonable price. I mean, it still cost like $35 shipped for this tiny little box. But either way, I got a copy of it now uh, and I played it uh, all the way through once. I talked quite a bit about it in my most recent exclusive opinions episode, uh, but at a very high level, it's all about making um, uh, flocks of goats, uh, herds of goats. Yeah, herds of goats <laughs> uh, trying to uh, take scoring cards. But the, the main conceit of the game is you can play any number of cards from your hand as long as they all have the same value. And that value is one to five. And then after you play those out, you then draw cards 
present your hand equal to the value of the cards you played. So if you played four number two cards, you will then draw two cards because that was a two value. If you play one five card, you will draw five cards into your hand. And there's a, a neat uh, balancing thing where you don't want too many cards in your hand because then they turn into penalties and you want to put the cards out in certain orders. Otherwise, they'll turn into penalties. It's not a crazy deep game overall, but I enjoyed my one play. It's super cute. And I'm definitely going to be throwing that one into my game bag, likely for a while going into the future. Uh, after that, we have Legends of Hellas, which was the other really small uh, card game that I did not know anything about that showed up at the same time as Animalia, uh, Preventing Extinction. I should have done my research so I could tell you a little bit more about them. They they, they both sitting on my desk over there, and I'm, I'm hoping to crack the shrink and learn how those play and potentially actually get them played relatively soon because they look uh, lightweight and uh, they look kind of interesting. I know that one was like a one to three player game. The other one was a higher player count. But again, I'm bad and I didn't do my research to tell you which one's which. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, either way, next up we have Nefertiti. Uh, this game came out a while ago. I first heard about it on the Hidden Gems podcast. I mentioned that a couple times in the last couple of vlogs. Um, it's a podcast that talks about older games or forgotten games or just overlooked games. And they really liked Nefertiti and I thought it sounded fascinating when I listened to their episode. And then I found a copy for, I think, about $25 shipped. So I picked up a copy of it. It's a... Uh, auction style game, but you actually bid with workers. So it almost seems more like a bidding worker placement kind of game. I haven't played it yet, but um, I have a copy now and I'm really looking forward to actually giving it a try. Uh, after that, there is Oasis. And um, <laughs> actually after that, there's also Portobello Market. And I'm just going to tell you that Nefertiti, Oasis, and Portobello Market are all games I had not heard about before. I learned about all of them on the Hidden Gems podcast, and then I bought all of them <laughs> based off of that podcast. So there you go. Uh, that podcast is definitely part of the reason why I've been buying so many games lately. Uh, I've played Oasis a couple of times now, really quite enjoyed it. It's an Alan Moon design from, I think, 2004, maybe-ish. Uh, it's got this uh, fascinating idea where you're doing card trading, not negotiating, but you're putting out lots of cards and then other people are taking yours, but you don't know what cards you're going to put up. You just know the number. You're like, I'm going to reveal this card and people can take it. Oh, you know, I'm going to reveal that card. Oh no, that card's really good. And it's it's a pretty wacky game and I've played it at four and five and I quite enjoyed it. Uh, Portobello Market, I actually played just a couple nights ago and I talked about uh, Oasis and Portobello Market in my most recent um, exclusive opinions episode. I played Portobello Market at three players. Um, um, I didn't like it quite as much as I was hoping to overall, but again, if you want to listen to me talk about it for like 10, 15 minutes, then uh, check out my exclusive content. <laughs> uh, finally, there's Santiago. Uh, I played a five-player game of Santiago on Tabletop Simulator about five or six months ago, and it really grabbed my brain. Fascinating game. I think it's about 20 years old. And uh, from what I understand, people who like Santiago tend to consider it a five-player only game. Uh, it plays lower player counts than that, and I would be totally willing to try it four players, but um, I found a copy that was very cheap. It was less than $20 shipped. Uh, so my one experience of loving it made me interested in uh, picking up a copy because it was so cheap. And hopefully at some point I can get a five-player game or maybe a four-player game of it going because my first uh, impression of it was was very glowing. I don't think I ever actually talked about it in any impressions type content, but if I play it again in the future, I will certainly cover that one in one of the exclusive opinions episodes. So yeah, that's all the games that have entered into the collection as well as the games that have left. And now let's move on to the upcoming schedule for the next three weeks. Uh, next week, I'm planning on putting out uh, Finca. Uh, that's going to be week 15 of the year. And Finca is a game that came out, I think, in 2008 or so. And it was uh, nominated and won the vote for the bonus video for April. Uh, so that is, uh, again, voted on by the contributing producer level supporters of the channel. I was really happy to see this one win. I think Finca is a lovely game. And I I, uh, I got to uh, fully film that one just a few days ago, and it was fun to get back into it. Every time I play Finca, I'm surprised at how simple and elegant that game really is. So I'm hoping to put out the uh, the tutorial for that one, uh, and it'll be a full playthrough as well um, in week 15. Uh, that week, I will also potentially put out um, the Freight Cars video, the tutorial that I mentioned that's just off camera over here. Uh, so I'm going to edit that one up and hypothetically put it out that week. And also, you know, if things go well, I'll put out the uh, playthrough with Anastasia for Hellas. Uh, can't commit to that, but that's what I'm hoping will be the time frame for putting that one out. Uh, moving on to week 16, I am hoping to put out a uh, tutorial for Space Station Phoenix. This is the newest release, or one of the newest releases from Rio Grande Games. It hasn't actually 
done its full release yet, so it's possible this one might get pushed off a bit if the uh, release gets pushed off a little bit, but hypothetically, I'm hoping to put that one out either that week or the week after that, or, you know, later on if it gets pushed back more. But I have fully recorded that one, and that game is super cool. Uh, I actually played that one um, with my wife Jessica when I had it. I only had the box in our house for three days, then I had to ship it on to somebody else. But while it was here, I played it once, and I was so taken with it that I talked about it for 18 minutes <laughs> in my exclusive opinions episodes about it. So I have a lot to say about that one, and I'm really looking forward to playing that one more. I'm also just looking forward to digging into the edit for that because it's a cool game. Uh, that week, I'm also hoping to put out the other uh, playthrough with Anastasia uh, for Equinox. So we'll see if that all goes to plan, but it's fully recorded. So I should be able to edit that up and get it out then, hopefully. Uh, after that, in week 17, I'll be doing the live Q&A vlog for the month. It's a bit later on than I normally do um, in the month. I usually do it in the middle, but for logistic reasons, it made sense to do it later. It's going to be on April 27th. That's a Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Um, as usual, those usually take about um, an hour or so, so you'll be able to uh, join in and uh, ask questions if you want to, and then I'll put an edited version of that one out at some point later on that week or the next week, something like that. Um, I'm also that week planning on putting out a tutorial for The Gallerist. Uh, now, this one was actually voted on and picked as the bonus video for March, and it's not March now, and I fully understand that, and I'm planning on putting this video out at the end of April, so it's a little bit late, but The Gallerist is a Vitala Serta game. It's got a lot going on, and I have not been able to sit down and really do it justice. So I should be able to do that later on in this month, and I'm planning on putting that video out um, in that week. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, I almost made a full playthrough of The Gallerist, like, seven years ago, six years ago. I can't remember when I first got it, uh, and I was relatively new to making playthroughs. I sat down and started recording a full playthrough of it. Um, this is, like, back before I made Scythe, I think, and whatnot, and I recorded for, like, two or three hours, and then I realized I'd made, like, five huge mistakes, like, fundamental flaws to the game because I just messed up rules. I just forgot about really key things, and I got so frustrated that I just scrapped the whole thing, and I never got back to it, and here I am, like, five, six, seven, I can't remember exactly how many years later on, and I'm going to do it for reals. And now I've been doing this professionally for so long, and I've done hundreds of these, so I'm much more confident that I'll be able to do it justice and actually show it all. I will admit, though, I'm, I'm slightly nervous that I'll fall into the same mistakes I made all that time ago and then waste a bunch of time. But either way, that is when the galleries should be coming out. And then hopefully I'll be putting out a Games Radar vlog that week as well. It might be the week after that. It really kind of depends on how things shake out. Um, over the course of the next month, I'm also planning on releasing a couple of Friendly Ties episodes. Again, that's a, a group effort for with me, Anastasia, and Nick. I, I mentioned this earlier on in the episode, but we have one coming out for Cape May and another one for Maracaibo Uprising, and it's possible both of those might get released uh, before the end of the month over the course of the next three weeks. We'll just have to see how all that goes. So yeah, that is the upcoming schedule, and that's uh, essentially going to bring this update vlog to a close. Um, I I hope people like the playthroughs that are coming out soon. I've certainly enjoyed recording them uh, with the experiments as well as the ones that are hypothetically going to be the first ones to go out there, and I'm actively looking forward to getting feedback from people about it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some people are going to like it more than others. Uh, I imagine... Some people won't like uh, the fact that we don't have our faces on screen, we just have our hands, but then again, that leaves more room for us just to highlight the game overall, and it just makes a lot more sense for how we want to actually do these things. So I hope they're as entertaining as I, I, I feel they're going to be, and uh, time will have to tell. So yeah, that's going to bring this one to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.